in the case of the Wellington earthquakes, because we had such an unusual earthquake, which really only excited certain types of buildings, there's been a process we've followed through there where we've effectively called, we've, we've called it profiling, finding out which buildings are most likely to have been damaged, looking at the critical damage states that, that they might have um, that might have happened, and then um, turning that into a, a sort of a, a full detailed evaluation process for those buildings. So we're typically targeting the ones which have got the most damage. So this is basically um, a structural engineering toy um, built with the, the intent of showing how buildings behave in earthquakes. And so we have the three models here, if you like, this one representing a short, um, stiff building and obviously taller, medium-rise, high-rise building, a lot more flexible. Now what happens when an earthquake hits is the ground starts moving and you'll get different forms of shaking. If you get very short, sharp shaking, you'll find that the, the small buildings are affected. And on the other hand, if you get very long, slow shaking, you'll find the tall buildings are affected. Or, fairly obviously, something in the middle, and you'll get those buildings going. Now what's interesting about the Kaikoura earthquake, in Wellington at least, is that it basically got these middle-sized middle buildings going. And that's why we've seen damage in some medium-sized buildings, but not, as many people expected, in the earthquake-prone buildings. One of the important things about this earthquake, which is really tied to how unusual it's been, is because of the distance to the epicentre, so 240 kilometres, but that's because of the progression of, those, um, of the earthquake, it's kind of focused energy in Wellington. It's filtered out a lot of that high frequency shaking, so we've had that sort of long period shaking, which is why those middle sized buildings are getting excited. There's been a leadership group set up from sort of representatives of the major practices around the city and they're advising Wellington City Council on matters around building damage, um, how best to evaluate buildings, and what sort of processes Wellington City Council should go through to make sure that you know, buildings have been properly checked. So the, the assessment process starts pretty much straight after the earthquake. Um, as soon as there's been a, a large enough earthquake, um, the civil defence, if, if civil defence get called out or otherwise the Wellington City Council, might engage with the engineers to do an immediate assessment of what's going on. So there'll be a rapid evaluation which is done um, by the controller or people acting for the council right at the start to decide if there's been a lot of damage. If there has, they'll then proceed to call out engineers to come along and do what's called a rapid post-disaster um, usability assessment. And that involves the engineers doing what's called a level one and a level two. Now a level one involves engineers literally walking the streets walking around the outside of buildings, not going in, but just to make sure they know what hazards there are that could stop people from entering the buildings, or what, more importantly perhaps, if they're coming out of buildings, what hazards might be presented by the surrounding buildings. So they'll do their best to find out if there's something wrong with the building, but they won't actually go in it at that stage. It's a very quick process, it might take 20 minutes for a building, but it's really just a getting a, a scoping exercise done, if you like, to see how much damage there is. Following that, um, a level two might take place, and that's looking at a, um, going inside the building, looking for the key elements of, that might have happened that have caused damage. And so looking to see if there's, um, the stairs are in sound order, looking to see if there's damage to the main supporting frames. Something that would make the building um, unusable, in which case they can put a, a placard on it or advise the owner that um, the building shouldn't be occupied. And so the important thing all the way through um, the rapid building assessment process is that the engineers are not and cannot assess the capacity of the building. All they can really do is do a relative assessment where they're looking at what's happened to the building and considering whether that's made the building any worse than it was before the earthquake. One of the um, issues that we've had to grapple with, with earthquakes, and it's not just here in Wellington, it's happened in Christchurch, it's happened in many other parts of the world, is that um, People will get into buildings and have a look. Engineers will assess buildings very quickly on the basis of what they've seen. They may not see everything, and through the process of, of information that later comes to hand, they may learn different things about what they have seen. And so it is conceivable that, a, that the engineers can um, look at a building, and then in the time that follows, they might find a reason to change the, the assessment of that building. Now, uh, so consistency is very important and also getting that information out there so that all engineers are, are working with the same information is important. Since the earthquake in Wellington there's been meetings of um, engineers on a regular basis, typically a weekly basis. They have what they call a clearinghouse where engineers come along, share information, 
talk about what they've seen, discuss what the implications of that are, and they can therefore learn from each other as to what's really happening. And that's important because then if they can um, look at that and think of what they've seen, if they decide that they need to go back and revisit something, then they can do so. And so it can result in um, building evaluations changing, buildings that have been open and subsequently closed, and really that's just the consequence of further information coming to hand and what people are learning as they're going. It's pretty important to know that not all damage which you can see, not everything that's visible is actually a sign that there's any problems with the building. It might just be cracks in the, in the partitions, it might be um, dislodgement of, of non-structural elements, it might be all your stuff getting knocked off the desk. All of that tells you you've been through an earthquake, it doesn't actually tell you what's happened to the building. And so it's the job of the engineer when they're doing <coughs> these inspections to try and figure out you know, what holds the building up. The engineer is then going to be looking to see if there's damage to that. Again, not just a bit of cracking, because that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but to see if there's damage which might indicate that the building's capacity to resist the next earthquake is reduced. So, depending on the circumstances, uh, normally a building evaluation is initiated by the owner. Um, they want to know what's happened to their building. It then depends on how well the engineer knows the building, how much it is that they have to see. So if, if an engineer knows a building well, if they've been through the drawing, drawings, they understand what makes it work, then it may be that they can go straight to the point and they don't need to see everything about the building. On the other hand, if they don't know the building well and they're not sure what holds it up, then they have to be a little more comprehensive. So typically a level two assessment might take a couple of hours for a, for a building, but it might take longer or shorter depending on how much they know. Usually, um, when they're working for the owner, they'll report to the owner, and the owner would then report to the tenants in the building and give them the information about how, how badly damaged it is or whether it's um, good to occupy. Sometimes tenants will see things that, that perhaps the engineers didn't, and it's important that that information is brought to the engineer's attention, but provided that not everything the tenants see will actually be significant. However, there are a number of things that people should be looking for. So we don't worry, for example, about cracks in jibboard walls unless the jibboard is so badly damaged that it's starting to fall off the wall because that tends to say that there's been a lot of other movement in the building which we really need to know about. We don't worry about small hairline cracks in concrete element, elements because that just means that the concrete's cracked and quite often concrete will crack during construction. It's just a natural process. However, we're particularly uh, interested when we see um, carpet tiles on the floor, for example, if the carpet tiles are spread apart, that means the floor's grown. If the floor's expanded, there's a reason for that, and we need to get down there and have a look at it and find out. So the simple rules about earthquake preparation, I guess, first of all, to remember the, the basic instructions, the drop, cover, and hold, which everyone's pretty familiar with. Um, but secondly, to just to, to be prepared, have the, um, know what you're going to do, have your emergency response plans in place. Make sure that you know, in the event of earthquake, where you're supposed to go, um, have your, your emergency supplies set up and all those sorts of things because while we'd like to say nothing's going to happen that we haven't already seen, we just never know.